Hello, I'm Adrian Gowdy and today we're going to discuss abdominal aortic aneurysm scanning. So why do we do this? Well, a rapid diagnosis means that you can get your patient to treatment rapidly. And for a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm, this is obviously very important. In a study that was performed in Adelaide many years ago now, their time to the operating theatre from presentation was reduced from 90 minutes to 12 minutes for those patients who had emergency department ultrasounds performed. Further, we know that misdiagnosis is quite common. The classic triad of hypotension, back pain and impulsatile mass only occurs in 50% of these patients. If we can exclude the diagnosis, then we can prevent unnecessary investigation and we can drop our anxiety level for the treating doctor quite considerably as well. We know that ultrasound is highly sensitive and specific for detecting abdominal aortic aneurysm. So to refresh your anatomy, this is the retroperitoneal structures in the abdomen. We have the midline structure being the aorta with the celiac axis, the superior mesenteric artery and the inferior mesenteric artery coming off anteriorly. To the right of that we have the inferior vena cava which of course sits underneath the, underneath the liver. The aorta sits on top of the spine. The technique we use, we generally use a low frequency probe because we want penetration, this is a deep structure. We go in the midline position Traditionally, we scan from the epigastrium down to the bifurcation, and we do this in both transverse and longitudinal. If you're having trouble, though, sometimes if there's a lot of gas in the upper abdomen, sometimes it actually helps to start further down just above the umbilicus to find the inferior portion of the aorta and then scan back up to, to look at the more superior portion. Don't forget, 95% of abdominal aortic aneurysms are infrarenal. You usually need to apply fairly firm pressure to try and shift the bowel gas out the way so you can visualise the aorta that lies behind it. In the transverse view, we're looking for a pulsatile, round structure that lies anterior to the spine. In the longitudinal view, we're looking for a long, tubular structure that again is anterior to the spine. And in the longitudinal view, we can see the sp we can identify the spine because of the scalloping shape of the vertebral bodies. If you get a good view, you may well see the celiac axis and the superior and occasionally even the inferior mesenteric artery, although generally this is quite difficult and isn't absolutely necessary to identify the vessel. As patients get older, the vessel often becomes ectatic as well, and so it may well not be in a nice straight line. It often bows off out to the left. When we do our measurements, we measure in both the transverse and the longitudinal planes. The transverse is generally more accurate, but can overestimate the reading if you're measuring it on an angle. The longitudinal view, you can actually underestimate the measurement if you're slightly off to one side, but it's very difficult to overestimate. So if we do both and we come up with a measurement that's about the same on both, then we know that we're fairly accurate. On the longitudinal view, you can try and identify the superior mesenteric artery and look at the neck of the aneurysm to see how far away it is, and that can help you determine if it's infra or suprarenal. In the emergency setting, I wouldn't bother about doing this because really it makes no difference. If it's rupturing, it needs definitive treatment, and if it isn't, then you can get more formal imaging later on. When you are doing the measurements, please make sure that you include any thrombus that is formed within the aneurysm within the measurement. You're actually measuring from the wall to the wall. So for example, in this case, this was a measurement, and here the person has measured the residual lumen, but they haven't included this thrombus. So this is wrong, this has underestimated the size. Here we can see the vertebral body lying posterior to the aneurysm. Here, this is the correct measurement, including the wall and including the thrombus. And so the actual measurement of this is a seven and a half centimetre aneurysm.
Here is a, an image showing the normal anatomy. This is the longitudinal view. We have here the scalloping of the vertebral bodies, and we can even make out the intervertebral discs here. We have the liver at the top here, the left lobe of the liver. And here we have a long tubular structure that has anterior branches. This is the celiac axis, this is the superior mesenteric artery. Now, you'll see this in young, thin patients and sometimes some older, thin patients, but in somebody who's got a lot of abdominal pain and a lot of gas, you usually won't see these vessels. So you can't always use that as a criteria. This tends to be what you see more often in a patient who's a little bit uh, of more usual size. Here the aorta, as you can see, is a lot deeper. We see the bright scalloped edges of the spine here and a tube, long tubular structure lying over the top. In the transverse view, we normally will take a picture proximally. And here we can see this is the proximal view, the aorta here, the IVC here, just got the front of the vertebral body, the liver lying here. And then as we come further down, here again we have the IVC, here is the aorta, and here is the spine and we would take a measurement just above the bifurcation. And this shows that we've scanned the entire length of the aorta. Now, there are some patients who are very easy. Unfortunately, the bigger the aneurysm is, usually the easier it is to see. But there's a lot of patients who are actually very difficult. The obese patient will give you a lot of trouble. Patients who are guarding won't let you press hard enough to move the gas. Patients who've got a lot of gas and make it almost impossible to see the aorta. If there's a surrounding hematoma, that can also make it quite difficult to see your normal structures. In these cases, sometimes what you can do is, is instead of coming in from the front, come in from the side. And you can use the liver or the kidney as the acoustic window from the right hand side, the spleen or the kidney on the left hand side. Most commonly what we'll tend to do is roll the patient on their right side, so left side up, and in particular for the obese patient, there's often a, a little groove or indentation uh, where their large abdomen comes around to the side. Put the probe in there and press in from the side. But if you do this, you have to make very careful that what you're seeing is actually the aorta and you're not imaging the IVC accidentally. This is one of the most important things that you have to make sure you do when you're imaging the aorta, and that is to make sure that it is truly the aorta that you're seeing. The IVC is a long tubular structure that lies pretty much in the midline, so it's very easy to mistake it. However, the IVC is on the right, so if you see two structures, assuming that you don't have situs inversus, the one on the right will be the IVC. The IVC does not become calcified, it doesn't have atherosclerosis. So if you see atherosclerosis and calcification, then you know that has to be an artery, it's not the IVC. If you get the patients to take a deep breath in, or in particular to sniff quickly, then you'll often see the IVC collapse, but that can be quite hard to tell. And again, if your patient's actually in a lot of pain, it doesn't work very well. As we've mentioned, if you see anterior branches, that's helpful, you know it's the aorta. But in the difficult patient, you usually won't see these. You can, if you want to use pulse wave, look at the pattern of flow within the vessel and determine is it arterial or venous. That's technically a little bit more difficult. And certainly when you're starting off, if it's getting to the point where you really need to do that to be sure, you're probably better off saying, I don't know, I need somebody else or I need some different form of imaging. One of the very important things to remember is that the IVC pulsates. So just because you see a pulsating structure does not mean it's the aorta. To show you that, here we have a loop. Here we have a long tubular structure, which you can see is pulsating. Here is the liver, and in fact this is the IVC coming up and running through the liver. Now if you look very carefully, you may even be able to make out the double venous pulsation of this vessel. In patients in atrial fibrillation, of course, you can't rely on that to distinguish between the IVC and the aorta. But as I said, just remember, pulsation does not mean it's the aorta. You still need something more.
If you do do pulse wave, this is the typical arterial trace that you'll get. Whereas for the IVC, we don't have any of those pulsations there. But as I said, to start with, if you're unsure, you're better off saying, I don't know. We define an aneurysm as being the increased diameter of 50% above the non-dilated part of a vessel. In terms of the aorta, we generally use a measurement of 3 centimetres. Now, when it, for small aneurysms, that is those below 4, and 4 centimetres, the risk of rupture is small. It still exists, it's about 2%, but it's very uncommon. The larger the aneurysm, the greater the risk of rupture. You can look for retroperitoneal and intraperitoneal hemorrhage, but they are rarely seen. In particular, intraperitoneal free fluid, which means that the aneurysm is ruptured into the peritoneal cavity, is usually a pre-morbid sign, because at that point, the patient's exsanguinating rapidly, and they usually don't last very long beyond that. Very occasionally, you might see retroperitoneal hematoma, but it's not a reliable sign and we'll talk about that in a moment. In terms of the types of aneurysms, the vast majority are fusiform. Occasionally you can get a saccular aneurysm, but they're very rare. This is a fusiform aneurysm. This is about an eight centimeter aneurysm, which we can see quite easily. Here is the spine here, and here's the aneurysm here. We have some thrombus up here, so we would measure from here down to here. This is a smaller longitudinal aneurysm. Here we've got the spine with the scalloping here and this is four centimeters. This is the longitudinal view. This is an image of a saccular aneurysm longitudinal. Here we have the aorta coming down here and then the aneurysm. From a clinical perspective it doesn't make much difference whether it's a saccular or a fusiform aneurysm from the emergency department perspective. So what are the pitfalls of this technique? Well, the biggest thing you have to be concerned about is measuring the wrong structure. If you measure the IVC, well, the IVC doesn't dilate much, so you'll get a normal measurement. Now, I've certainly seen somebody say they had excluded an aneurysm when in fact what they had done was measure the IVC. Similarly, there were reports of people measuring the superior mesenteric artery and even measuring the vertebral body. From the literature, there is one report of somebody here who felt this was a thrombus within the aneurysm, but the shape of it doesn't really fit that. This is actually a paraaortic lymph node. But again, that's a very uncommon set of circumstances. The most important thing to remember in scanning aneurysms is that the ultrasound will tell you if there is an aneurysm or not. Do not rely on it to say that there is an aneurysm that is not leaking. Ultrasound is not reliable and cannot tell you that. Very occasionally you might see signs of a leak, but from the literature that's less than 4% of cases, and many of the other patients that you will see, you'll say there is an aneurysm. That then raises the potential that it may be leaking. And in that case, if your clinical suspicion is such, then you need to go on and do further imaging. Or if their clinical situation is such, then they go straight to theatre. Don't feel that you have to measure something. Please, especially when you're starting off, don't be afraid to say that you can't tell, it's an inadequate scan. Remember, when experienced sonographers do aortic scans and their patients are stable, they're fasted, they're not in extremis, they're not guarded, well even they fail sometimes and they'll fail in a few percent of cases. They try very hard not to, but there are some patients you just cannot tell. In the emergency setting, it becomes even more difficult because they're not fasted, they may well have pain and guarding, they'll have a lot more gas. And so when you're starting off, I would say expect 10 to 
of your scans to be non-diagnostic. If you're getting less than that, then maybe you've just got to think, are you overcalling what you're seeing? Make sure you're actually seeing the aorta, that you've seen it in its full length before you can say, yes, I've imaged this, there is no aneurysm. So during the course, we'll get you to scan some normal anatomical models. These are generally young thin people, so you can see all the anatomy and learn all the structures. And then we'll get you to scan some patients who've got abdominal aneurysms and you can see if you can accurately measure the size of their aneurysms. In addition, there'll be a workstation for you to come and have a look at a series of examples of abnormal scans. Thank you.